So I'm Dr. Jane Haley. I'm the scientific coordinator for Edinburgh Neuroscience. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing my work colleague and my friend, uh, Professor Tara Spires-Jones. So Tara is the Professor of Neurodegeneration here at the University of Edinburgh. She's a program lead at the UK Dementia Research Institute here in Edinburgh. And she's the Deputy Director of the Centre for Discovery Brain Sciences. She trained in Oxford and at Harvard Medical School. And in 2013, she arrived in Scotland to set up her research lab here. And we've been friends ever since. So I'm delighted to speak to you this morning, Tara. Thank you, Jim. So I know that we're both looking forward to going to the FENS Forum meeting in Glasgow uh, in the summer. So I thought maybe we'd start by asking you um, what it is you're going to talk about <laughs> while you're there. Well, I'm really excited about this. So what I'll be speaking about at the FENS Forum is part of our work looking at how synapses degenerate in Alzheimer's disease brain, and in particular, how the non-neuronal cells in the brain are contributing to this phenomenon. So Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure most of you are aware, is one of the biggest health challenges of our time. There are about 50 million people worldwide with a diagnosis of dementia, and the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's. And to make matters worse, there are currently no disease-modifying treatments, so we can't do much for these 50 million people, and it's costing the world about 800 billion euros per year to care for them. So what we're talking about, what I'll be speaking about in the forum, and what we're doing in the lab is trying to understand the fundamental brain changes that cause Alzheimer's disease. And the, the particular bit that I'll speak about is this neuronglia interaction. So over the past few years, we've realized that the neurons in the brain aren't acting alone in neurodegenerative diseases, despite the name, that it's really the whole neurovascular glial unit that contributes to neurodegeneration. And in particular, the glia, the microglia, and the astrocytes seem to be playing a role in how the brain is susceptible to degeneration. So I'll explore that a bit in the Fence Forum talk. So thinking about your area of research um, and you know, the excitement around the neurovascular unit and um, what do you think the current challenges are in, in the, your field at the minute? Well, as a field, dementia research has some massive challenges. So just last week, another of our large clinical trials failed in the field. Um, I, I wasn't involved in it, but it is a big blow every time that happens, because ultimately, we all want to help people living with dementia and find life-changing treatments. So I'd say one of our biggest challenges is translation. We're learning an awful lot about how the brain changes. We're learning about potential mechanisms, potential interventions, but we're failing to get that last step into patients. So um, I'd say that's one of our big challenges. Historically, another of our big challenges has been a lack of funding, <laughs> but that is starting to change. We've been funded much less than cancer, for example, or infectious diseases to some extent. Uh, and that refl that's reflected in the lower number of papers, so the less amount of data that we have about these changes in the brain. Even though we've known about Alzheimer's disease for over 100 years, since Alois Alzheimer described it in 1907, we still have no disease-modifying treatments. And I think that's just our massive challenge, is getting to that stage where we're helping people. Yeah, I can see that. And so, you know, that seems a little almost depressing in the sense that you're struggling to make progress. So perhaps we could uh, talk about what, what's really exciting in your field at the minute. Well, I think there are lots of really exciting things. And one of them is what I'm speaking about is that as a field, we're starting to understand more about how all of the brain is contributing to dementia and neurodegeneration. And that's come from uh, a lot of different angles. One of them is the genetics that have driven our understanding of disease pathogenesis. So we've known for a few years that there are really, really, really rare mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease, but they're vanishingly rare. Less than 5% of people with Alzheimer's have these mutations. But there are lots of different genes that can increase your risk or even decrease your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And these were discovered largely with GWAS, genetic genome-wide association studies. And a lot of those genes are converging on things that are expressed in glia, in particular microglia. So that's been really exciting to try and bridge this gap, this challenge of how do these genetic risk factors change the brain to influence your risk. And if you look at another one of the big uh, contributors to Alzheimer's risk, which is environmental risk factors, we know that things like age is the biggest risk factor, but also your lifestyle, things like education and um, how you eat and whether you exercise, those all mod modify your risk. And many of those risk factors are also pointing towards things like glia and vasculature as potentially involved. So I think that's really exciting. We're really getting into this biology. Another really exciting thing about the field is we are 
getting more uh, support, we're getting more funding, and we've changed the public conversation about dementia instead of it just being you get old and you get a little doolally. We understand now, and people all around the world are understanding these are diseases, and that as such, it, it is a brain disease, and brain diseases can be treated. We can find ways to treat them. So, in particular, I would say research works. So we've seen successes with things like cancer. We're even seeing successes with some brain diseases now with things like SMA. And if we continue this amount of fundamental research and the funding, things like our UK Dementia Research Institute, which was a massive investment, I think we will get there and, and we will have disease modifying life-changing treatments for people with dementias. Well, that really is exciting. That would be very exciting. So so Tara, I, I've seen you arrive here in Edinburgh as an early, a fairly early years um, researcher, start starting up your, your, your lab here in Edinburgh, and now you're a professor here, and, and so I've seen you develop, and I just wonder um, you know, what sort of things that you've learned in that journey as a researcher transitioning through your career? That's a really good question. Um... So I've learned a lot of things, I hope, and <laughs> not enough, but one of the things, one of the most important things I think I've learned as a scientist is to follow the data. So my mentor, Brad Hyman at MGH, was always saying data are data, follow the data. And one example of that is um, we had a project when I was, I had just set up my first faculty position at, at MGH, Harvard Medical School in Boston. And one of the first PhD students I supervised, we were testing the hypothesis that um, the tau, which is one of the proteins that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease brain, accumulates in these tangles, and these tangles that were first described by Alzheimer, we, we hypothesized that these were killing the neurons. These are toxic. So we went and we found, I spent a couple of years <laughs> validating a new method of, of looking at caspase activation, which we thought would be a marker of apoptosis in dying cells. Got that working, got it working with the stain for the tangles, and thought, great, now we can go and prove the hypothesis right, that, that tangles cause cell death. But what we actually found was almost the opposite. We found that caspases were active, and then the tangle accumulated, and then the cell didn't die. And it turned out to be one of the most interesting and puzzling findings, and it ended up being a nature paper for that oh. PhD student. <laughs> so that's one important yeah. thing, follow the data. I think another important thing for people who might be on the early stages of the career path is that, um, for, for me, this job is the best job in the world. I absolutely love it but it takes quite a lot of resilience and you have to be able to um, take a lot of rejection. People are always rejecting your papers and your grants and your ideas, which it really hurts. But at the same time, the positives for me really outweigh the negatives, which is we're seeing new things every day. So uh, just the other day, I was looking at a bit of, of dolphin brain and looking at Alzheimer's pathology and the glia and the, and these dolphins that had aged and nobody had ever looked at that before to my knowledge. And I find that, sense of wonder really over, overcomes all the negatives of being a scientist. Absolutely, a sense of wonder I think never really leaves scientists, so that, that's marvellous. And um, I have to say it's my um, pleasure to work with all our researchers here in Edinburgh. It's one of the best things in my job is working with wonderful people, inspiring people like you, Tara, and I'm absolutely privileged to count you as my friend, so thank you very much indeed. And I think we're both going to look forward to going to FENS. Absolutely. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. We'll see everyone there in July.